you have your Bibles with you this morning, I hope you do. I want to encourage you to open them to Colossians chapter 3. If you're finding your place there, I want to welcome all those who are joining us via our live stream. We're so grateful that you're worshiping with us in that way, and I also want to welcome Reach Church DeSoto and the venue service down the hall. Thank you for joining us today. We're continuing this glorious gospel series, and as a deacon body, uh, we've been challenged to memorize Colossians chapter 3. And, uh, and so I thought it fitting that I would also have an opportunity to preach a passage that I've been meditating on a lot. And so this is going to be a joy. Um, originally, I was going to attempt to preach 1 through 17. There's way too much in this chapter, so we've narrowed it down to 1 through 11. Um, the first service, I did pretty good. See, Saturday night is kind of my trial run on this deal. So Saturday night crowd, they get my first, uh, first draft, if you will. And uh, they get the long version, uh, the unedited version. And then I find out what jokes work and don't work. And, uh, and then I cut those. And the first service was the guinea pigs this week. And Pastor Chuck was preaching for me on Saturday night and did such a great job. But you'll get a little bit of edits because there were some that bombed horribly in the first service. So you have to watch the 930 online if you want to get the bad jokes. Um, but uh, I do want to encourage you, if you're able to be with us tonight, 7 o'clock right here in this room, the Value Them Both um, event we're having, uh, Tony Perkins will be here. And uh, if you haven't registered, I want to encourage you to do that for us. That it would just be helpful. So if you could do that, we'd be grateful. Um, you can text VTB to 89449, VTB to 89449, and that'll register you. And uh, you need to register each of you separately, so I know it'd be easy if you could just register your spouse with you. You need to do each one individually. We'd be grateful, and we do want to encourage you, don't, just a heads up, uh, if you can, no bags tonight, and if you have one, just know it'll probably be, I just want to do a quick look through, um, just for security purposes. So just be aware of that. Come tonight prayed up. Come ready to, to worship the Lord and, and to hear a very... Uh, powerful message, and also to be uh, more knowledgeable of what this amendment is. Uh, but today, Colossians 3. The Colossians were, as we talked about even in chapter 1, they were being robbed of their spiritual identity in Christ. That Christ is good, but if you, if you want to go on to maturity uh, and all that God has for you, you've got to involve yourself in mysticism and philosophy and legalism and asceticism, which they, he addresses, Paul does primarily in chapter two, all those issues are addressed. And uh, that final one, asceticism, you see at the very end, just the harsh treatment of the body, like a, uh, going to be a monk or a hermit and sitting in sackcloth and cloth and ashes. Not, not true uh, pure morality, but these external activities and the harsh treatment of your body as a means to earn uh, favor with God and earn his righteousness. And it's interesting as you study these things, the issue of the Colossians was, it wasn't specific to them. I love this about God's word. The issue that Paul is dealing with in the Colossian church are the same issues that we deal with because all of these issues are in the DNA of the fallenness of man. Um, I think all of us recognize this kind of the default position of our life is to seek to earn our salvation, that we, we kind of want to have a part to play so that we can get a little pat on the back for what we do. And so it's kind of innate in us, and that's really what Paul is dealing with here. Um, look down, in fact, look at verses 20 through 23 in chapter 2, just kind of a preface to our chapter. He says, if you've died with Christ, the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit uh, yourselves to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, uh, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and the teaching of men. He says, if, if you've died uh, to the world, uh, if you've died in Christ to the world, why are you living like the world? Um, that this, this worldly, innate sinfulness in our hearts that seeks to earn the favor and the righteousness of God, why are you living like that? Well, Paul's frustrated. Why are you living like that? And he, he says here that those are the commandments and teachings of men. That, that, this isn't from God. This is just the teachings of men. And then finally, in verse 23, says, These matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom 
uh, in self-made religion, self-abasement, the severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. He's saying all those external activities that we go about, the acts of religiosity that, that we think are going to be effective, he says it's just like putting lipstick on a pig. It, it doesn't really get down to the heart of the issue. Uh, you know, we, we do these things. I, I remember when I was in college and just, just be really beginning to grow in my faith walk. Um, I wanted to memorize Philippians. I mean, it's going to help me. And it did. It was an enormous help. But you know what? I memorized the whole book and guess what? I'm still just as capable of sin as I was, but that my flesh doesn't care how much scripture I know. I still have to struggle with the flesh of Francis of Assisi called his uh, flesh brother donkey, except he used the King James version of donkey, you know. He, that, that our flesh is like a donkey. It doesn't want to do what we want it to do. We have a sinful flesh that we have to struggle with. And, and Paul says all these external acts of religion, they really don't get to the heart of the issue. So he's frustrated. They, they've been robbed of their identity in Christ, which is the most important issue when it comes with dealing with our sin and the flesh. And Paul gives them one of the finest statements in all of God's word on what it means to live the Christian life when he uses this phrase, in Christ. If you've read Paul's letters, it flows throughout all of his letters, in Christ, over and over again. It's vitally important that we understand what it means to be in Christ, that, that our identity in Christ is the source from which all of the Christian life flows. That you and I, by faith in Christ, we've died with Christ. We've been raised up with Christ. This is the beauty and the wonder of the Christian life that sets us apart really from every other religion in the world. That you and I don't have to do anything to atone for my sins in order to gain the righteousness of God. That my sin and sin has been punished in Christ who died on the cross and the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to my account on the basis of faith. It's a gift of God through faith. It's the wonder and the mystery of trusting Christ, that when you trust Christ, you're in Christ, you're united with Christ, you have a new identity. That, that everything that the, the Lord Jesus has done for you now belongs to you in such a way that you can say that when Christ died, you died. When Christ was buried, you were buried. When Christ was raised, you were raised to a new life. Isn't that the picture of baptism? It's a symbolic picture of what's occurred to you by faith, that, that you died to an old way of life and buried with Christ and raised to walk, resurrected with Christ to a new life in him. And I'm so secure that he is what now? Christ is hidden. Our life is hidden with him in Christ. And one day when he returns in glory, we will be with him. That all the fullness that God supplies belongs to us in Christ. Listen, there are far too many Christians who go through life without ever hearing that by becoming a Christian, they're in Christ. And so they try to live the Christian life out of their own resources and their own power instead of living the Christian life in Christ. And so the rest of this chapter, really, Paul shows them their identity in Christ and he shows them how their identity in Christ will create a new mentality. That if you're in Christ, you're going to have a new mentality. You're not only going to have a new mentality, but that new mentality will drive different activity. And I think so often in this world, we get it backwards. That's, I think, what the false teachers were trying to do. That I have different activities, these external acts of a religion, that hopefully change my mind so I can find a new identity in Christ. And the gospel is the exact opposite of that. Through faith in Christ, I'm in Christ. My identity is in Christ. And my identity in Christ is the source that creates a new mentality that creates different activity. But it all starts, it begins with being in Christ. So let's just read this chapter, then we'll work our way through it. Beautiful words. Look at, and we're just gonna read the first 11 verses, but look there. Verse one. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of earth, for you have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Therefore, consider the members of your 
earthly, well, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you'll also be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly, life, earthly body as dead to sin and immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it's because of such things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. In them you also once walked when you were living in them, but now you also put them all aside, all anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. And don't lie to one another. Since you've laid aside the old self with its sinful and evil practices and have put on the new self that's being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian and Scythian, slave nor free man, but Christ is all and in all. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would instruct us by means of your word and your spirit today. Lord, I pray and ask that you would bless your word. And God, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to obey. Lord, I pray for those of us that today would say we are in Christ, I pray that you would root out sin. We know that you began the work, you'll complete it, you'll carry it on. We ask you today by means of your word and your spirit, continue to root out our lives so that we would live lives that bring you glory. God, if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, I pray today they would see the beauty and the wonder of Christ and the gift that he's made available to them through his death and resurrection, the gift of salvation and eternal life. I pray that they would know that salvation, that rebirth today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, look at verses one through two. It says, therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. And here's the simple principle. Those who are in Christ will set their mind on Christ. Those who are in Christ will set their mind on Christ. They'll have a mind that's fixed on Jesus. They'll love Jesus. Listen, you, you can't really love Christ unless you are in Christ. A, a lot of people, they come to Jesus, and they, Jesus is just somebody that they can kind of take or leave. Well, this is good. I'll take a little Jesus here, there. Listen to me. If Jesus is someone you can take or leave, you might as well just leave him because he won't be taken half-heartedly. Listen, once you understand what Christ has done for you, you'll love him. When you know who he is, you know what he's done, you'll love him. That he's taken all of your sins upon on his shoulders. He's taken the weight of God's wrath on his shoulders. He's died in your place as an object of wrath, cursed of God, cursed as anyone who dies on a tree. He died the death that you should have died. He triumphed over your enemies. And all the riches of God's glory come to you by faith in him. When you understand who he is and what he's done, you'll love him. You know, one of the favorite parts of my job that I get to do is to meet with people who are joining our church and I get to hear their story. I met with several folks this week, but three, I'm telling you, there's three of them that their stories were just absolutely overwhelming. Many of these were people who had been saved for many years. They could not get through their testimony without weeping over the grace and the salvation that they found, not by their good works, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Do you know what I found? I have found people who are in Christ. They love Christ. They love him. They love him, and they fix their mind on him. And this is so critical because one of the great keys to a fruitful Christian life lies in our mind, in our mind. And when I talk about your mind, I'm not talking about your intelligence level. Amen? I say amen. The fact of the matter is, some of the most intelligent people in the world are totally incapable of setting their mind on Christ in heaven. It's not a matter of intelligence. A mind that's set on Christ is not a matter of intelligence. It's a matter of what you love. It's a matter of what you prize. Listen to me. What you prize, you'll set your mind on. Um, I love watching football and I've had the great joy and the blessing of watching uh, football in a lot of great stadiums. I've been to Owen Field in Norman. I've been to Kyle Field in College Station, Bryant-Denny Stadium, Tuscaloosa, South Bend, Indiana. I've been to Texas Stadium, God's team, the Cowboys, amen, Pastor Bill. Um, And uh, been to Arrowhead. How about that? 
You know what's interesting? You go to these games, and I'm not, listen, I'm not being critical because I'm one of them. I go to these games. You get into the, you're fixed in that game, aren't you? The people who go to those games, they're engrossed in that game. Now, and again, I don't want to be disparaging, but if you've been to some of those games, you know that a lot of those stadiums are not filled with the brightest people in the world. The point being, you don't have to be really intellectual to fix your mind on something. In order to fix your mind on something, you've got to love it. Listen, you love Jesus. You'll set your mind on him. One of the keys to Christian life is setting our mind on Christ. Can I just ask you today, in those moments, as you lie in bed, at the end of a day, what are you thinking about? Boy, you talk about it. And I, I want to be very careful this morning. God has been all over me this week. So I'm not preaching down to anybody. We're all going to feel miserable here a little bit, all right? So just join with me. Listen, what you think about says a lot about what you love. And if you love Jesus, you'll have a mind, mind that is set on him. And guess what else? They're hidden in Christ. Look at verses three and four. For you have died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you'll also be re revealed with him in glory. So you're in Christ, you love Christ, you set your mind on Christ, and you're hidden with Christ. What does it mean to be hidden with Christ? When he says you're hidden with Christ, it means that your life, when you are in Christ, when you've known his salvation, you are totally secure. That through faith in Christ, your life is now hidden with Christ, and he goes beyond that, in God. You can't be any more secure than that. Jesus said, no one can pluck you out of my hand. And now we have on top of that, so Christ has you in his hand, and God's hand is on top of that hand. If you're in Christ, you are totally secure, and you have the assurance, he says here, that when Christ is revealed, then you'll also be revealed with him in glory. We've died to Christ. We've been resurrected with Christ. One day we'll be revealed with Christ. Do you see the progression here? I'm in Christ, then I love Christ, I set my mind on Christ, and I'm hidden in Christ. And then what Paul does in these following verses is tell us that those who are in Christ, those who love Christ, those who set their mind on Christ, who are hidden in Christ, guess what? They'll become like Christ. If you're in Christ, you love Christ, you got a mind that's set on Christ, you'll tend to become like the people that you fixate on. That's a fact. But even more than this, it has greater significance for those who of us who have been born again by faith. John said, what a great love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called his children. You've heard me say this before. How do my boys know that they're my boys? Well, they can show you a certificate. But somebody could doctor that. How do they know that they know that they know that they're my children? Because unfortunately for them, they'll begin to look and act like me. Listen, you can't be in Christ and not be becoming more like Christ. Why? Because it's a part of your identity. It's who you are. And so he begins to tell us what it means to become like Christ. And, you know, the, the, the sanctification process, the process by which God changes us more and more into the image of Christ. And you need to know that today. If you're in Christ, do you know that God has one goal for you? It's to make you look like Jesus. And making you look like Jesus, it involves both addition and subtraction. Um, if you're exercising with the goal of gaining weight, you know there are things you have to take out of your life and there's things you've got to add to your life, exercise and other things. And it requires both. Same thing with our sanctification and God growing in Christ. There's going to be some things he takes out of our life. There's going to be some things he puts into our life. What Paul talks about here primarily is the things that he subtracts. Uh, you've heard me say Michelangelo was asked... How are you going to turn that big stone into a sculpture of David? And Michelangelo said, I'm just going to take away all the parts that aren't David. 
Do you know what God's going to do to you? In the process of making you into Christ, he's just going to take out all the things that aren't Christ. And so what Paul does here is he shows us how God begins to extract these qualities, these attributes that naturally come about in our life. Removing sin. One of the most often, the most often asked questions as I do discipleship that I get is, how do I overcome the sin? How do, how do I overcome sin? And you, quite honestly, you read Paul's passage here and other places, and he tells you to put off the old self, and you're like, Paul, t- give us the answer here. Because we want a three-step process, don't we? I think Paul would say, if you look closely enough, the answer is right there in the text. I'm not giving you a three-step process today. I don't want you to mishear this. But I do believe that there's some principles that must be in our life if we're going to remove sin, if we're going to work with God in the process of removing sin in our life. So I want to give you three that I think we see here. First, well, four. Because first, it begins with being in Christ. I've already said this, but you can't change yourself. If you are here today, you don't know Christ, you're not in Christ, no matter how many self-help books you read, no matter how much you try to grit your teeth and discipline yourself in order to change, you gotta be in Christ. Now, you can do a lot of religious activities that, as Paul said at the end of chapter two in Colossians, that will make you look wise in accordance with the world, self-made religion, but it'll never really transform you from the inside out. Um, When Faith and I were first married, we rented an apartment, we rented a house for a little while. And if you know if you rent, uh, if you rent a home, you can't can't really renovate, can you? You can only decorate. You can only put some things up here or there that may change the pictures that are on the wall and things like that, but you can't really renovate. There's a lot of Christians out there that claim to be in Christ, but they're just decorated. I want you to know today, Christ doesn't want to just decorate your life. It's not just about having the Jesus bumper sticker, the ichthus on the back of your car. Christ wants to renovate. He goes about the process of changing us. When you're in Christ, he begins to work. You will be changed. How do we work with him, though? Beyond that, what do we do? Number one, you must acknowledge your sin. You gotta call it what it is. In in verses five through 11, we get two lists of sins. The, The first is a list that deals primarily with personal and private sins. Um, Look at verse five, it says, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, and that immorality is specifically sexual immorality, pornea. Immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire and greed, which amounts to idolatry. It's interesting, in this first list of sins, the first area that he deals with is areas of sexual sins. Why? Is it, is it because the Bible is against sexuality? God forbid God gave us our sexuality. It's a part of God's design to long for relationships and intimacy. And it's an area that every one of us have to deal with. But what Satan does is he tries to distort this wonderful gift that God has given to us. Listen, the worst is always the corruption of the best. And God wants to give you his best. This is interesting as I was thinking about this week. In the areas of sexual sin... It's the one sin that given the right circumstances in the right context, it's a wonderful gift given by God. But outside of the appropriate context, it's evil and sinful. As I was thinking about it, I think it's the only sin that kind of does that, that is right or wrong dependent upon the circumstances in which it's done. But God wants to give us his best in this area. And what Paul says here is that sexual immorality Sexual immorality that we, we often disguise under the title of love. If you follow the progression here, he says it's just pure and outright greed. It's a, it's a selfish greed that says, give me, give me, give me, and amounts to idolatry. 
And instead of our sexuality becoming this wonderful gift that God has given to us to seal our love within the confines of the covenantal marriage relationship, a a gift to glorify God and to serve our spouse in our sinfulness, it becomes uh, to us an idol of greed that we feed upon for our own sinful gratification. And we hide it and we disguise it and we excuse it and we explain it away. But listen to me, we will never overcome sin until we call it what it is. That at the end of the day, it's selfish greed that amounts to idolatry. And people explain it away with a lot of ways. And then the second list is is, uh, sin in our relational life. Look at verse 8. But now you also put them all aside, all anger and wrath and malice and slander and abusive speech from your mouth. Don't lie to one another. You put off the old self with its evil practices. You know, the, the number one way in which we expose the condition of our heart is through our speech. How you verbally respond to people in situations is a great revealer of the condition of your heart. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart in Matthew 11. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so we find ourselves in these situations where we slip up and we say things. And what do we do? That's what we say, exactly what we say. We say it's a slip up. I didn't mean to say it. And we start to excuse it away. And the fact of the matter is you did say it. And it's sin. And Paul says we need to start calling these things for what they are. And notice also, don't lie to one another. Since you put aside the old self with its evil practices, all of our half-truths and our deceptions are sin. They're part of our old nature. And part of our, our new nature, our new identity in Christ, is that we love each other in how we talk to one another, how we interact with one another. Look in verses 10 and 11. It says, and, we, and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, nor free, but Christ is all and in all. This is powerful. Listen, you know what he says? One of the defining marks of those who have been raised up with Christ, who have died to sin, who have put on a new self through faith in Christ, is that the first thing that we notice about another individual is not what we can see with our eyes, but Christ in their heart. Isn't that powerful? How much of our activity, how much of our interaction with other people would be changed if we saw that brother and sister in Christ as a person in whom Christ is pleased to dwell? How much more respectful would we be? How much more kind would we be? How would we change our language? But do you see what Paul is doing here? Is it, If you're going to overcome sin, you got to first acknowledge it. Don't excuse it. Don't explain it away. Call it what it is. This means that you and I, we get on our knees before God and we confess that we have a covetous heart. We confess our idolatry. We confess our greed that I have hate and I'm a liar. We confess these sins before God. You want a good picture of this? Look at Psalm 51. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you're justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Do you know what Nathan did to David in his sin with Bathsheba? He finally called David out and he called his sin for what it was. And David, if there was ever gonna be repentance and a renewal of God's work in his life, he first had to own up to what he had done and call it for what it was. Then secondly, I think, well, by the way, you've heard me say this before, but in order to come to God, you don't have to be perfect, but you do have to be perfectly honest. You have to own up for for your sin. You have to understand what it is and call it what it is. Secondly, you must see your sin in light of God and his wrath. Look at verse six, for it's because of such things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. You know, more often than not, when we sin, we like to compare ourselves to other people. We, in, in other words, we see our sin in light of others. That I'm not as bad as that person. I may dabble in it here and there, but it's not that bad in comparison to what some other folks do. And listen, as long as you 
see your sin from the perspective of other sinful people, you'll always have a means by which you can explain it away. You'll always have a, a means by which you can justify your sin as not being that bad in comparison to other people. But listen, if we're gonna overcome our sin and move on to maturity, we must see our sin in light of God's wrath. And where was God's wrath most fully displayed? On the cross. Listen, when we see our sin in light of God's wrath poured out on Jesus Christ, when he became sin who knew no sin, when Christ on that cross took every evil sin you've ever committed and ever will commit and placed it on his shoulders and bore the wrath of God, and God who cannot look on sin looked away and Christ cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When we see what our sin has caused, we see the wrath of God and the love of Christ, it should grieve our heart and move us to turn away from sin and turn to Christ. We must see it in the light of the wrath of God. And then thirdly and finally, we must, we must put our sin to death. And to me, this is the most costly. That there's attitudes and activities that we gotta put aside. Part of our old self, our sinful flesh that we put aside. Yeah, I think one of the most difficult things, the further you walk with Christ, Maybe it's just me. I've said this in a couple of contexts this week, but the longer I follow Christ, the more sinful I feel. It's like the closer you get to the light, the more your sin is exposed. And you think, boy, I've done pretty good here. And then Christ exposes another idol that you didn't even think was an idol. And even though I've been walking with Christ for years, I'm like a little kid wanting to cling on to my sin. And I confess that a lot of times, rather than just putting it aside, he has to pry it out of my hands. The idea is we put it to death. We lay it aside. We move forward as, as men and women who have put on a new self that have been raised up with Christ. We take it seriously. Jesus said in Matthew 6, if your right eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. If your, your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off. He says you can be engrossed in these things. They can take you captive. You remember God said to Cain, sin is crouching at your door, but you've got to master it. You better deal with it, Cain, or it can lead you down a path that leads to eternal destruction. You've got to deal with this. Listen, Jesus made that statement. I don't think he was calling us to amputation or eye gouging, but I do think what he was saying when it comes to sin, we do whatever necessary to remove ourselves from those sins that hinder our growth in Jesus Christ. But listen to me, this is not about a set of rules. Not about a set of rules outside of us. It starts with a new heart within us. We have to remind ourselves again and again that all of this flows. That was the purpose in Paul writing, that all of this flows out of your new identity in Christ. That if you're here today apart from Christ and you're just seeking to be a better person, you're gonna grit your teeth, try to do better. Listen to me, you're just putting lipstick on a pig. You may look wise, you may look spiritual, but you haven't really dealt with the root of the problem, which is your heart. You can seclude yourself, isolate yourself. As I was saying this, I was reminded of the, the guy who wanted to become a monk. You heard the story, he goes to the lead monk and says, I want to become a monk. He says, you got to take vow of silence three years. And at the end of the three years, you get two words. Takes the vow of silence three years, at the end of the two words. What are your two words? He said, food, bad. Gets another three years, comes to the end of it. What's your two, two words? Bed, hard. Goes another three years, lead monk says to him, what's your two words? He says, I quit. <laughs> and the lead monk says, I'm not surprised. You've been complaining ever since you got here. <laughs> the point of the matter is, you can isolate yourself. You can go try to be Amish and not touch anything past the Industrial Revolution. But I'm gonna tell you what, even the Amish deal with sin. 
And you're never going to change until you find yourself in Christ, till you find yourself in a place where you realize the depth of your sin and the chasm of separation that your sin has caused and you begin to realize, there ain't no way I'm ever getting to God on my own. And you run out of yourself and you feel the weight of your sin. I heard a guy tell his story this week and he said the weight of his sin was like, he said God exposed to him after many years of walking against Christ. It was like all of his sin came up in his face and it was like this weight that was being pressed down upon him and he began to weep even as he told the story. And he said his eyes were open to the glory of Christ. He trusted in Christ. It was as if, it was if the weight of that sin was just removed and he found himself engulfed in the love of Christ. Listen to me this morning. If you try to do it on your own, you can't. We're not here today giving you a set of rules or even the Ten Commandments. We're offering the righteousness of God on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ. And today, apart from no act of your own except believing in Jesus, the righteousness of God can be transformed, transferred into your account by faith. And listen, God will begin to give you a mind that is set on him as you love him. And your mind will change and your activity will change as you follow Christ. Listen to me, but once you are in Christ, know this today, God will begin to graciously and patiently root out sin in your life. And I'll tell you, the process isn't always fun. It can be painful. It's like surgery Isn't it interesting? You let this person make cuts and incisions on your body with the goal of making you better. You're thinking, this doesn't seem right. They're going to cut off my leg and put it back together with different parts, and that's going to be great. Listen, God is a great physician. And he will take the scalpel of his love, and he'll begin to carve out areas of sin. It's not always fun. In fact, I had this week a guy in one of my discipleship groups and we're memorizing, we're studying marriage, and we're memorizing a verse on suffering. He says, this sounds like fun. You're going to tell me how to be a better husband, and then you're going to make me memorize a passage on suffering. And I said, yes. Because you want to be the husband God's called you to be, and you want to know the wonder and the joy of loving a woman like Christ loved the church, then you're going to have to let God do some serious surgery on your heart. Not always easy, but the work is worth it. And the question is, can God take a group of people and conform them to his image? Can he do that? Can he take a group of people and conform them to his image so that they resemble his nature and become his representatives on this earth? Yes. Yes, he can, and he has, and he will. As I was reading these verses and studying on them, I remembered uh, a story, uh, a guy named Peter Lord, um, Jerry Sheridan, who's gone to be with Jesus, set me on to Peter Lord and some of his books, and uh, he's got a book called Turkeys and Eagles, and uh, in this book, he tells the story of some little eaglets, and they're in a, in a nest on a cliff, and the mama leaves, and they walk out of the nest, so they climb out of this nest, and they walk, and they they find a, a bunch of birds. And these birds, these birds, they kind of look like them, but they're not eagles. They're turkeys. And these little eagles start doing what the turkeys did. The turkeys scratch the ground, they scratch the ground, but it doesn't feel right. And these eagles, they, like the turkeys, they start eating acorns, but their beak's not quite right, doesn't feel right. The, The turkeys would gobble and the eagles would try to gobble. You ever heard an eagle try to gobble? It's ridiculous. These turkeys, they're fat and squatty little guys and the eagles are sleek and lean. And the eagles, they started to have a real self-image problem. And every now and then they'd look up at the sky and didn't know why, but they just felt like they were supposed to be up there in the clouds. And one day the owl, the voice of wisdom, said, your problems, you don't know who you are. You're not turkeys. 
And the owl pointed up to the sky, and there they saw in the sky a creature that looked like them. He had these big wings, big strong wings, and he would swoop down and dive with tremendous speed. And the owl said to them, that's who you are. And the little eagle said, what do we do? And the owl pointed to the cliff. And he said, you have to leave the land of turkeys if you're going to fly with the eagles. Some of you here, spiritually speaking, you are eagles. That is your identity in Christ. You were made to fly. You were made to love like Christ, live like Christ, be transformed by Christ. But you're trying to live like a turkey. And what do you do? Remember who gave you life. Remember the one that gave you life. Look to him. Look to Christ. Set your mind on Christ. And listen to me, you're going to have to go off that cliff. In following Christ, you can't be half in and half out. There's only one way to know the real joy. You've got to leave the cliff. You're, you're never going to fly with the eagles in the land of the turkeys. Some of you, you're turkeys, <laughs> spiritually speaking, and you snuck in here with the eagles. And let me tell you something. You don't have to stay a turkey. You can fly too because the God of this universe loved you even as a turkey, which is what I was. And he sent his son to die on a cross for your sins. Shed his blood to remove to offer you the free gift of salvation by means of faith. He offers his promise and his spirit to all who will receive him. And if, if you're here today, you're sad, you're discontented, you're unhappy, you know that you're headed for the just condemnation of your sin, I offer you today, again I say to you, I offer you today not religion, I offer you not the Ten Commandments. I offer you the righteousness of God in the person of Jesus Christ by means of faith. Today you can be born again, an eagle, to fly and live for Christ and glorify him. But no matter where you're at today, I would tell you today, present your life to Christ. You know, each week there's a song that comes to mind, a hymn. We got one today too, but no real story to go with it. I just, this, there were two, two songs, two hymns on my mind this week. I shared both of them with faith and listened to both of them many times this week. But one that just stuck with me, and in fact, I can't hardly listen to its words without crying. The first service, I was up here like a fool. Um, and maybe we'll get through it this week, but, or this service but it's take my life. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. And, and I want us to stand. If you're at Reach Church DeSoto, you stand there in your service, venue service, you stand too. And I want, as we sing this, Pastor Bill's gonna lead us. Let this song be your prayer today. To be in Christ, to set your mind on Christ, to give all of your life to Christ. Let this song be your, be your prayer as we sing together. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my life and my days, let them flow in ceaseless Let them flow. 
Let's do this next verse. Take my silver and my gold. Not a mite would I withhold. Let's sing that verse. Take my silver and my gold. Not a mite would I withhold. Take in light of what you have done for us in light of your love demonstrated on the cross where you poured yourself out unto death the greatest act of love and mercy and grace ever known to man in light of that love and sacrifice I pray we'd lay all of our life down today Help us to remember from whom we've come. Help us to remember our identity that we're in Christ. Let us never forget what you've done. And may your spirit and our hearts be inclined to set our mind on you, to love you and follow you, to be hidden in you, and to be changed more and more like you. And Father, I pray for the one in this room that doesn't know you and they're wondering, What in the world's wrong with these folks? Why in the world? How could they lay all their life down? God, open their eyes to your love. God, open their eyes to Christ and the depth of their sin. Overwhelm them today. Cause them to be reborn by your mercy and your grace through faith. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.